And uh, Stephanie Bayer is giving the talk. Hello. I want today to give a short overview how one can construct an efficiency of a knowledge argument for correctness of a shuffle. And this is joint work with Jens Kroos from University College London. And I will start with some motivation. And I picked as a motivation e-voting. We all know in a vote, the voter casts the secret votes and in the evening the authority reveals this vote in random permuted order. And in this e-voting scheme we are looking at at the moment, the voter casts the votes on a computer and sends the vote to a server and this server sends an all votes to a central authority and the central authority reveals the votes in random permuted order. So obvious to have a safe and secret vote, we have to decrypt our votes. So we are using Elgamal encryption in our setup. And the property we are most interested in is this homomorphic property. That means if we have two ciphertexts and multiply them together, we get a new ciphertext which contains the product of the original messages. And with this, we can define the re-encryption operation. So what we want, we have a ciphertext, and we want to get a new ciphertext, which contains the same message, but looks completely differently. And we can do this by multiplying the original ciphertext by a random encryption of one. And we use this re-encryption to define a shuffle. Here we have a bunch of input ciphertext. And we pick a permutation and permute the input ciphertext. And then we, we re-encrypt them by multiplying this encryption of one to it. And this gives us output ciphertext. And because we use this re-encryption, the output ciphertext looks completely different to the input ciphertext. And because we permuted the ciphertext, we don't know which original input ciphertext belongs to which um, output ciphertext. So, and this server in our setup so we vote, we send this vote to the server, shuffle the vote and send this to the central authority. And to make this more secure, we use a mix net between. So we have our voters, the voters votes, encrypt the votes and send them to the first server who picks a permutation, shuffle everything and send it to the next server. This next mix server again picks a permutation, shuffle and send it on. So we're using a lot of mix uh, servers here. And in the end, everything gets get decrypted using threshold decryption. So threshold decryption here ensures that all parties have to work together and nobody can break the anonymity. And we see the output here are the original messages which we inputted in the mixnet, but they are in permuted order. And this permutation pi is a product of all permutation used in the mixnet. And that means each server knows only part of this permutation and nobody knows the whole permutation. So nobody can link a message to a person. And, but what hap happens if one mix server is corrupt? So let's assume the first mix server is corrupt and instead of shuffling everything, he replaces some votes with some new ciphertext. So nobody can see that he replaced vote. This shuffling operation normally prevents people to link input to output, and if we replace some ciphertext with new ciphertext, this looks completely different to the input as well. So what's happening in the end after the next shuffling? We see after the decryption that part of the messages are replaced with something new, and if we are in this voting scheme, that means that this server can change the outcome of the election. So we have to prevent this. And to do this, we force all mix server to send together with the um, with output ciphertext a zero knowledge argument. And this means if the next mix server accepts this, we know no message is changed because a zero knowledge argument should be sound. And we also know in the end, after the decryption, so we know after after the decryption, all messages are the same as we input in the mixnet. And we also know that the permutation is still secret because we're using a zero knowledge argument and the part of the permutation, this pi one is still secret, the pi two is still secret. Let's have a closer look at a zero knowledge argument. So here we have our prover and our verifier. Both know the public key for the encryption, the input ciphertext and the output ciphertext. And the prover also knows the permutation and the randomness he used for in the shuffle. 
and they can talk back and forth, and the verifier asks challenges to the, um, to the prover, and the prover has to answer them, and then the answer verifier should accept and say, yes, the shuffle was done correctly. And what we want, obvious, if the prover does everything correctly, the verifier accepts. And we want, if the prover tries to cheat, the verifier rejects with overwhelming probability. And the easiest way to get soundness and correctness is for the prover to give the verifier his permutation and the randomness he used. And the verifier takes this and the input and constructs the output himself, and then compares the original output and his new output, and if they are equal, yeah, he accepts. But that means we have to open the permutation and the randomness. And so the, the verifier learns the part of the permutation, and we have a lot of mixnet, and everybody sends a zero knowledge in an argument that he's done everything correctly, so and everybody learned the permutation, and that contradicts the anonymity. So that's, that's the reason it's important to have a zero knowledge proof, so that nothing but the truth is revealed, and in the end, the permutation and the randomness is still secret. And we are looking at real-life applications, so it should be efficient. So we want to have small communication and small computation cost. In e-voting, we want to have the results as soon as possible after the pooling sto station closed and not days, weeks later. So more precisely what we are doing, we have the prover, verifier, statement, and both knows also the setup of the group which we are using for the Algamal encryption and some com common reference string. The verifier picks the challenges randomly, uniformly from set Q, so we are in public coin, and we are constructing an honest verifier zero knowledge argument. It means as long as the verifier is honest, he learns nothing. That's not what we want in real life, but it's possible to convert a zero knowledge argument in a standard zero knowledge argument with only constant overhead. And our contribution is now a honest verifier, zero knowledge argument for correctness of a shuffle in the common reference string model, which takes nine rounds. And the um, complexity is for n equals m times n ciphertext, we have sublinear communication, m plus n k bits. So for instance, if we pick this m equals square root of this n, we get a complexity of square root n. Our prover takes log m n exponentiation, and the verifier has some exponentiation which are linear in this n. Let's compare this to former work. So we see that our verifier takes 4 in exponentiation, and this is as low as we can get using Algamal encryption and if we are not using any special tricks to calculate the exponentiation. We see our prover takes 2 log m n exponentiation if we have constant rounds. So this is not really optimal. We want to have something linear here. But if m is not chosen too big, we are still in the same range as former work. And even if m is a little bit bigger, we have a very quick verifier. So in total, the total time of a shuffle argument is in the same range as before. And we can also get the cost of the prover down to something linear if we allow more interaction between the verifier and the prover. And we also see that our communication cost is lowest so far. Nobody achieved this. And there are a few reasons why we got this. So first is the kind of commitment we used. So what we want, we have one vector, and we want to commit in one single argument. And this single argument should be smaller than the original vector. So we want to have length reducing commitment scheme. This commitment scheme should also be computational binding and perfectly hiding. And this commitment scheme should be homomorphic. So if we take two commitments to two different openings and we multiply them, we get the commitment to the opening of the sum of the openings. And the commitment scheme we use to, uh, is the general Peterson commitment. So the public key here is the H and the generators G are in a group, and we have a randomness here, and these are the elements we want to commit to. So, besides of this length reducing commitments and batch verification, which was done before in shuffle arguments, we used a special kind of challenges. Instead of picking n random challenges, the verifier picks just one challenge, 
and verifier improver both construct this um, vector of Vandermont vector, and this helps to reduce the cost dramatically. So this gives us a sublinear communication cost. So where do we use this? So this is our um, situation. Both parties know cipher input and output cipher text, the public key and the, for encryption, the public key for the commitments, and the prover knows also the permutation pi and this randomness R1. And the prover now wants to convince the verifier that he has done everything correctly, that he permuted the input cipher text and then we encrypted them. And to do this, the prover first commits himself to this permutation by committing to the values 1 to n in permuted order. He then gets a challenge x from the verifier, and then the prover commits himself to the permuted Wonderman challenges, and this is the same permutation as he used here. And he then gives an argument that both commitments are used, constructed using the same permutation, and he knows this permutation, and he also gives an argument that the output is constructed correctly, and using this permutation here, and he knows this re-encryption factors. To do this in more detail, we first, the prover first commit himself in A as a commitment to the values 1 to n, and we call this values 1 RA to AN, and he also commits in B to this challenge, permuted Wunderman challenges, x to the pi, x to the pn, which we call bi to bn. And he first gives this product argument for a and b, such that both these products are the same. And we see the ii as a permuted values 1 to n, and the bi as the permuted Wunderman challenges. And on this side, we have only i and xi. So if ii and bi are permuted with the same permutation, these two products should be the same, as this is just some polynomial where the roots are permuted. This is very inexpensive, so please see full paper for details. And secondly, the prover gives also a multi-exponentiation argument, such that the product of the output ciphertext to this permuted Wunderman challenges equals the product of the input ciphertext to the xi times some re-encryption where this row depends on the randomness the prover used. This is expensive, so I will try to sketch the idea here. And we will focus only on soundness. Zero knowledge is something which is very easy and cheap to add on top of on it. And we will assume for a moment that this row equals zero. So that means we don't have this factor here. And we can think of the situation that we only permuted the input ciphertext to get the output and never re-encrypted them. So that means this side and this side has to be the same. And we will focus on this idea, so some notation. Our big commitment B contains of commitments B1 to Bm, where each commitment, B, where B1 is a commitment of the first n element of the permuted Wunderman challenges, and the last commitment are the last n element of, this of the permuted Wunderman challenges. We will arrange our ciphertext in an m times n matrix. So we get m vectors of ciphertext. And having these vectors bi here and the ci here, we can construct an inner product. So if we take a um, vector ci to the power bj, this equals the product of the entry-wise exponentiation, and this simplifies the left side of our multi-exponentiation statement, so this is the left side, to this product which runs only over m elements, and we call this c. So now to the main idea. We have here our vector c1 to cm, and we have here our uh, permuted Wunderman challenges, and we can construct this matrix out of it. Each entry is a ci to the bj, and we see if we take the product along this diagonal, we get our c. So this is our statement we want to prove. The prover can also um, calculate the product along the parallel diagonal, so to get the ek and the e minus k, and the prover now sends this value, the EKs, to the verifier. 
and gets a new challenge back, challenge Y, and the prover first opens his commitments to this vector, so the commitment to the, this, this product of commitments to this vector, this should convince the verifier that the prover knows what's going on, that he knows what's inside the B. And the verifier then computes this vector C, which he, the verifier knows the output, so he knows the vector CI, so he can calculate this product. And the verifier checks if this vector C to this B equals the C, which can be constructed now for simplicity out of the inputs. So that's the input ciphertext to the Wonderman challenges times this product of the EK. And we're using Wonderman challenges Y here and Y here, and we have Wonderman challenges inside of, used inside of the EK. So a lot of this value cancel themselves out. And we can see with basic mathematical transformation that this left-hand side should equal the right-hand side. And if this is equal, the verifier accept that the prover has shuffled correctly. And we see this is efficient. We only need 2M ciphertext here. The verifier sends only 2M ciphertext here and N cipher elements in ZQ here. And for the verifier, the verifier needs N ciphertext exponentiation to construct this vector C and n ciphertext exponentiation to construct this C, and 2m ciphertext exponentiation here. So we get in total the sublinear communication cost, which depends linear on m and n, and the verifier computation of the 4n. So each ciphertext exponentiation consists of two group elements exponentiation, so we get to 4n plus something sublinear. So what about the prover? If we, if we try to construct this matrix naively, we construct each entry. So we need m exponentiation for each entry. We have m squared exponentiation in total. So we end, would end up with m squared times n equals m times n ciphertext exponentiation. That's quite expensive. But luckily, we are only interested in these products along the diagonal. So we don't have to compute the whole matrix. We can use techniques for multiplication of polynomial to use them in the exponents of the ciphertext. And we looked at fast Fourier transform. And this gives us this log mn exponentiations for the verifier. And this doesn't add any extra round for the prover because this is one operation for the prover. Or we can use more interactions, so verifier and prover talk more with each other. Then we need log m more rounds, but the number of exponentiation are linear. And we tried, we implemented to see the diff, how our argument behave, how quick it is. We use C++ and we use the NTL library by Scout and the GMP library and we looked at different level of optimization. We looked at multi-exponentiation techniques and, and fast Fourier transform and for our range of parameters, the multi-exponentiation techniques works better if m is small. So it takes a while till the fast Fourier, asymptotic of the fast Fourier transform kicks in. And that's similar to the, if we want to multiply polynomial. The polynomials have to be big before fast Fourier transform kicks in. And we also looked at this extra interaction and we used Tom Cook to multiply the parallels of the uh, matrix. And last, I want to compare our work. So we w compare it here with the Verificatum library by Wickström. And we looked at modular arithmetic where our group has an order of 160 bits and we looked at 100,000 ciphertext, and for these results, we choose m equals 64, and having two extra rounds of interaction. And we see our argument takes two minutes to verify a shuffle. The verificatum library takes around five minutes. So this is a special parameter which gives us the best value so we can't say we are two times quicker than verificatum. It depends on some variables. Verificatum is written in Java. We use C++. So. But both arguments are usable in real life application. I mean, that's quite 
quick for 100 ciphertext, and this is a very, it's not a powerful machine. But what can we say when we look at the argument size? Our arguments beats the verificatum argument by a factor of 50. So that's much, much better. And if we are in a setting where we want to have a very small argument size, our shuffle argument is more efficient than verificatum and all the former works before. So that's all I want to say. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>